Hello guys, this is GRN1, your radio operator. I'd like to welcome you to the first interviews video of the developers who worked on OW 20 years ago. Morgan has been interviewing Martin Klima, the project manager of Altar at the time, but also Jan Kratky, one of the 3D artists, and Arnos Mateika as well, the mission design supervisor. Let's begin. I wanted to ask you as a first question, yeah. um, just simply, how are you doing today? And wh what are your plans nowadays, you know, after mm. 20 years? <laughs> oh, I see. Yeah, this is a bit strange to me because he connects me with something which is which is like uh, part of my, let's say, beloved past, but it's not really my presence at the moment. Currently, I'm, I'm trying to have three companies regarding the foreign sales. So it's a lot of things to, to do. So I'm now a sales guy, I would say. Well, I'm, I'm very good, thank you. Uh, I've been working on uh, games ever since. I've been working in various companies. Most recently I'm working in Warhorse in Prague. And uh, two years ago we released our first game, Kingdom Come Deliverance. And then uh, uh, me, Tomasz Kucherowski and David Spachil Havran, we ran our own studio from then on for, I don't know, maybe eight to ten years. So I, le I left Altar at the age of 21. So I was there from the age of 17 to the uh, till I was 21. And it was quite, quite something for me at, the, at those days because it was like late 90s. And, you know, at that time, I mean, we hardly had a internet at home. Like. So it was definitely one of your first uh, major project in, in life. Wasn't yeah, it? it was really, it, it really changed my life in, in, in all respects because I, I, I met people who in a way shaped, shaped me what I am today and they really gave me certain direction. Even I still remember, for instance, I still remember discussions we had with Robert, we had with Martin Klima, like those discussions were really shaping for me because they were like over 30 and I was really a small boy. We were very lucky that we were able to attract uh, some really good people uh, for our game. Of course, we were very inexperienced, all of us, so we didn't have any experience with uh, game development or on any part of it. Not, not neither with uh, software development nor with the asset development, so it was uh, very much learning by doing for us time I just got uh, with one friend which uh, was just looking to be able to promote the video games outside of Czech Republic. Not only in Czech Republic itself because most of the developments was done that okay if the Czech studio created the game they sold it in Czech Republic and then nothing and uh, one of the games which uh, we uh, were talking about was Altar. I, I was just staying in touch with the Altar and we agreed to work with them on the uh, in the time in the original game. I think we've been, we've been working, when we started we signed the deal with uh, Virgin Interactive and it was quite good and we never been under serious uh, pressure to add something to game or take something away. We, we, we pretty much had our creative uh, freedom. Uh, then uh, just before uh, the game was released, uh, the, sometime before the game was released, uh, Virgin Interactive was acquired by Titus Interactive and uh, then we, we really didn't have any relationship with the people from Titus. They were, we, we never spoke with them and they never spoke to us. Hmm. The organization at, at the start of the development was a bit um, messy or something, but then it got uh, professionalized later. <laughs> yeah, the, th the thing is that uh, I would say uh, messy from the operational view because now I'm, I'm doing the project management and sales and you need to have uh, some rules how to go in and you uh, the time was okay you need to do these uh, missions that time the time and the deadline was like guidance not a rule yeah so uh, some things which we plan for having in two years done were in three years so even 
now I think now the game development is a little bit more professional, a lot more professional. But at the time it was done the way that it was like really passion that a bunch of people were sitting somewhere trying to create something. I was quite tired those days because I was waking up in the morning for, for school and then like at 2 p.m. I was going to the office and then in the evening I was going home and then studying for school. <laughs> Very intense uh, schedule. Yeah, and then yeah, then over weekend we were in the office all the time, like sleep, basically really we were sleeping under the tables and sometimes on a, like the evening we just went to pub and then we went home. <laughs> I think he might be exaggerating a little when he says that he didn't have his own computer, but of course it's 20 years ago, so I don't recall this uh, properly. I, I think everybody had their own computer and you were not forced to sleep in the office, of course. Most of the people that work for us were students or people that just uh, finished school. They were living with their parents mostly or they were living in dormitories in, uh, in the college. It was quite convenient to stay there overnight uh, if you wanted, and uh, and we did it a lot. I did it myself. I, I slept in the office from time to time, and this is the kind of uh, lifestyle and work ethics that you can have when you are 25 because uh, you you don't have uh, obli other other obligations. Usually, these people they didn't have wives or children. I was. Uh, an exception than being married and I already had two children but uh, okay we were paid but the payment was like uh, uh, not the main thing we didn't have a families which we need to take care of a lot of us were uh, living together with the parents usually the, the computers at the time were quite expensive and uh, if you wanted to play Doom uh, Quake uh, one party, then uh, the office was the best place where to do it because uh, there was a good uh, LAN connection and there were uh, computers good enough to uh, run uh, Quake. So, in, as I say, it was this uh, the whole development had this kind of a sort of uh, party atmosphere in a way that we were, uh, we, we really felt that uh, we, we are doing something exceptional, so it was more than just work for us. Oh, in a home, home it means back to the office, right? So we made some, some food for ourselves and we worked again. It was not very productive, but we loved it. <laughs> Uh, Havran, which is uh, one of the uh, graphic, I do remember that uh, at one time he was needed like 15 or 20 computers, which was nearly everything what he had, because he was doing uh, a work to school, which was a huge uh, airship which is going around the mist, and he was just because he is on art school. So uh, we were going to work. And we just say, okay, Havran, we need our computers. Oh, don't worry, it will just finish in few because distribution uh, computing and the, uh, the movie which he was doing was, I think, one and a half minute long at maximum. It was compute, uh, overnight and everything was like two weeks. And we were constantly saying, okay, we need to do our work. Please stop, we are rendering. Yeah. He was just like, uh, actually uh, encouraging us uh, to go to pub, please. I need to run there and uh, uh, my rendering. And there was a lot of, yeah, so many, many things I would consider it. It was like a really nice, enthusiastic work, but we were just playing. It wasn't like, yeah, work, oh, I need to go at work, I need to be at nine there or something. No. But still, yeah, but still, you know, they, they gave me they gave me certain confidence that I can do whatever I like and they they actually appreciate what I was doing and it was kind of nice because I, for instance, to imagine that I still had to ask for approval <laughs> the, the headmistress at the, at the school that I can go for a conference, right? Yeah. 
Mm. Because otherwise I couldn't leave high school. You know? so, so it was really like double life in a way. But you, you have to realize that really in 1997 or six when we were starting, that was it was a really different world from what it is today. And in Czech Republic as well as it is uh, in, in other countries, of course, one thing was that the gap between uh, post-communist countries and the rest of the Western world uh, was much wider than it is today. But even then, you have things like internet and uh, World Wide Web. There was no Google, uh, there was no YouTube, of course there was no Facebook. And this is, this is not really relevant to, to your question, but I'm just point, trying to point it out that yeah, it might seem that it was not that far ago, so long ago, but it actually was quite a long ago and, and the world has changed a lot. And at the time, it was uh, not that easy as it is today to rent uh, proper office space. Uh, the offices were not built yet, they were quite expensive, uh, they, and they were quite uncomfortable uh, because most of the offices were like old uh, office buildings built in the 80s or 70s, and they were usually quite poorly uh, executed. First, we hired a in, in a small house in Brno, like family house, uh, there was a widow living in a two-story house and she, she had the bottom floor and the up, topmost floor for, for rent. And we first we hired the, the bottom floor, which was actually underground, like it was uh, mostly in the basement and there was very little natural light coming into the flat. Which we, which we actually thought is good because if you are working on a computer, then the natural light is your enemy. So, so, and it was a small, I don't know, maybe it was just two rooms flat uh, with a huge, uh, huge cast iron wood fired uh, stove. That was the only source of heat in winter. So. We, we had to, to actually uh, yeah, like heat the, the place ourselves uh, by, by burning wood and coal in this stove. And, uh, and there we developed fish fillet and that was done by a team of four people, uh, which was uh, Vladia and Rumun, Radim Krzywanek, as two programmers and Tomasz Kucherowski and David Spacio as two artists. And then we have some more people, of course, working on it, music, sound, voiceovers and so on. But these four people were like the principal team. And then we started working on Original War and we hired or rented the top floor there. So we actually were renting both the, the basement and the top floor. And that was the room that Nazgul is mentioning, the room, I did the flight with three rooms and a bathroom. Like one night we brought a, a bus station to the office. Or to be more precise, there was a, close to our office, there was a, so that, there is like a kind of, I'm still actually living not far from there. So it's a, like a small, small square and uh, there was some detour of the of the usual line of the of the night bus because of reconstruction going on at the at the square. So they put some kind of this uh, uh, kind of small stand, you know, the bus stand, and we took all the stand and we put it on a toilet in the office. And there was this kind of like direction <laughs> where the vehicles would go, and we. We pointed the direction to the toilet and we left it there for half a year. Okay. <laughs> so that was kind of like vandalism we did, but I think the only one we did. You know, um, apparently you took a bus stop in the street and put it inside of the locals of Altar at the time? Yeah. That's... Some kind of thing like that. Uh, Do you, does that come to your mind? So we had on the toilet, we had a huge uh, sign, which I don't know where we took it but it was uh, uh, from the street somewhere. But 
yeah, we were young, we were drunk, and we were stupid. <laughs> so some some of the things like that appear. I do remember that uh, bus stop that uh, they were trying to take it uh, to to Altar to home. I don't remember if we put it back. <laughs> <laughs> But I do remember that we uh, just woke up one uh, one day and there was a, a bus stop, there was a one sign and the second was the, the cone when you have like, a, uh, there is a, some hole uh, in the street or something that the plastic one uh, cone was uh, in the middle of the room. That's all what I do remember. But it, was, it was like a huge long party. The E3 presentation of the game had like a half a million attempts at downloading the demo and it could have maybe brought some funds, I suppose, On the big to make the... Yeah, uh, it was uh, firstly announced the original war and there was a... Uh, uh, in a, quite a lot of uh, medias uh, in Czech Republic, Lelo, Score and other, uh, other publishing magazines they were just talking about the original war and they immediately tried to download the uh, download uh, the demo which at the time if I do remember was something like 200 250 megabytes which was really huge to download and uh, simply the server was unable to uh, to sufficiently uh, provide the bandwidth and as well a uh, response for all those requests so we I think it was the first day or day after we found out that uh, most of the attempts were just not successful to download it. Yeah, now it's very easy, to, you cannot imagine, yeah, I, at home I have a half a gigabyte line. Yeah, so to download something like that, it's nothing. I, I, and when the server was just after 30 minutes just saying, okay, not enough resources, restart all the threads, you just mm. had nothing, you had... 50% of downloaded uh, things, and they tried again and again. So, yeah, if it worked, I think there would be more uh, more people uh, around the world uh, which were interested in original war. I think a lot of them would love it really, really a lot. Do you have any memory of that? Absolutely not. It, it's possible we've been there. I'm sure I've been to E3 with the guys from Altair one time or another. I have memory of that. What was it 2000 or 2001 or 2002? I really don't have a clue. I heard that sometimes the publishers uh, requested some questionable things in RW. For instance, they wanted to, you to add dinosaurs to the game. Do you have any memory of your relationship with maybe your publishers or was it fine? I think, for, I think it was more of a joke than I, an actual like serious proposition and we never been under serious uh, pressure to add something to game or take something away. We, we, we pretty much had our creative uh, freedom. Yeah, there was some thoughts about that and happily we were... Uh, the whole team was just saying, oh, no way, because consistent with the story, era and everything, so gladly that there are no dinosaurs. <laughs> it shows that you are very um, liking the job you are doing since you are all, you know, in this kind of um, office and sleeping under, under the tables, as, as you said, all together, very nice. <laughs> I, I didn't really consider that to be work and I didn't even have proper contract for a long time and you know at, at the beginning, the beginning everything was kind of very strange it was it, it felt more like a like a strange type of club you know like where you go and when you hang 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 out like for a while because uh, we, we we were not even paid for a long time because there was no money yeah you know so it was really was kind of professional but really like not much. I think it was a, 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 an experience that had a profound effect on me and uh, I moved, uh, I, I, I really 
decided I will go full time into computer game development. Before that, I was still part time uh, working on uh, in the in the sort of traditional publishing uh, company, also called Altar, that uh, was publishing pen and paper uh, RPG, Dragon Slayer, and other board games. But uh, then uh, I decided I will go full tilt into uh, computer games development and I stayed there ever since. So it was a, it was an important milestone in my life. And uh, of course uh, we, we learned a lot about uh, computer game development and also the business side of things unfortunately. And, uh, uh, it was um, a project, I, I, I think, that uh, certainly a project that affected me most of uh, every game, all the games I've been working on. There were periods where there were really no money, like so, so the altar, you know, I guess you know it, so it was always like a publisher of the, of the uh, board games, right? Yes. So it, had, it has some kind of income which, which, uh, which Martin Klima used for uh, uh, for subsidizing this this computer part, but it was always the way that he came from Prague, you know, with some money in his pocket, and he put it on the table, and he, he who came and took something, that was it, you know. Huh. <laughs> okay. And it, wor- and it worked it worked this way like for two or three years, <laughs> and then and then suddenly we had a contract with with Virgin, and it changed a lot. So for a certain time it was kind of ordinary, like so we we received money every every month. But then there was this discontinuation because Virgin uh, were bought by, by Titus at the time and Titus had big problems. I mean, it was at the, at the turn of, of millennium and I think a lot of things were changing in, in, in this industry. So it, it seemed that many, many smaller publishers were like leaving the scene basically. Yeah, uh, uh, I think one of the things which we were considering was the to having the like a computer generated voice but still as it is now that time it was really not not working i for me for example i i like the english because i was playing everything in english and i do remember there were some voiceovers uh, from czech which i didn't like at all yeah, uh, you had to test it, you need to go through that, and for me it was strange to play a game which is speaking Czech, and the voice acting was not so good. The English one was much better, uh, because even for the actors here in Brno, because the, the, it was uh, recorded here in Brno, uh, for a lot of the actors was the first uh, even try to to have a voiceover for for a game, and, uh, of course the let's say the budget for the voiceover wasn't stellar, so you cannot uh, go and take the, the best play, uh, actors. But still, there was a really good uh, good actors in, inside of the uh, of the game. And did you take part into the Czech uh, dubbings? Um, yeah. Well, this is something I, I remember not the distinctly, but uh, all the foreign language uh, voiceovers were created by Virgin uh, in London. I've been to London to oversee the English voiceovers. And I think uh, it was one of the things, one of the lessons learned, which as I, I think I wish I knew before is that it was a mistake to cast uh, English actors as American soldiers because they speak with this fake uh, American accent and uh, an actual actual US players find it very annoying so when the game came out it got markedly lower review scores in US uh, magazines than it did in the European ones because and I, I think voiceovers were a big part of it. Uh, of course it was more convenient, cheaper probably for Virgin to do it that way. And again this goes to show what uh, how, how the world changed uh, 
Today it's easy to set up a recording session in US with US actors. Uh, you could do it over Skype. But anyway, they recorded that, they recorded all the other uh, languages and we had in the in the contract we have a card we had a carve out for Czech Republic like uh, the, on the Czech and Slovak Republic uh, territory we will be doing the distribution ourselves and we uh, record we did the uh, uh, the Czech voiceovers ourselves but uh, I didn't participate in that uh, much. Uh, it was done by our friends in Brno, or some members of the team. In Brno, they had some contacts uh, into like uh, theaters, and they could reach out to actors that do uh, voiceovers for movies, for Czech TV or cinema. Uh, so they were able to get us these contacts, and, and they basically organized the whole uh, recording session ourselves, uh, themselves, and then. And the game music was uh, produced by Michal Pavlíček, who is actually really, really famous uh, Czech uh, rock musician. At the time, I, I think, he, I mean, today, of course, he's much older and uh, he doesn't perform that much, but uh, I think he's still very well regarded. And at the time, he was really like a, a living legend of uh, Czech rock music. And he was part of a group uh, that's called Pražský výběr, which means like Prague selection, and it's, so the idea is it's like the selection of the best musicians, rock musicians in Prague. And they were they they were formed just like toward the end of uh, 80s, and they were really an excellent uh, rock group. The point is that. Uh, the frontman uh, of the band uh, was uh, Michal Poca, uh, another rock musician, and he was actually also active in 1989 uh, in uh, the Velvet Revolution, uh, the, the overthrow of communism in uh, then Czechoslovakia. And uh, I myself also have been involved in a way uh, in that uh, regime change. And so I formed a sort of a friendship uh, acquaintance with uh, Michal. And then uh, like 10 years later, uh, when we were looking for a, a composer for original war, I was able to approach him and say, we, this is the situation. We are looking for a musician that will compose the score for a computer game. And, and he said, OK, well, uh, Michal Pavlicek is your man. And here is a phone number. Call him and tell him Michal Kotsap sent you. And he will do. Uh, and I'm sure you will find some accommodation. And, and so I called Michal Pavlicek. And he, he's a really great guy. Like He's very professional. He took it really very, very seriously. It was not like I was sort of afraid that he will say it's a computer game, it's some like uh, piece of uh, entertainment. I, I am not interested in it and I, I don't care about it. So he did take something and to bother me, but he, he took it very, very seriously. He really, uh, he let, uh, he, he wanted to understand the story, what the game is about, you will notice really that the Russian music is different from the American music. Mm -hmm. uh, that uh, really this is this is sort of like the Russian music is what you like sort of imagine the Russian folk music uh, is like, and the same goes for the, the, the U.S. music. And I, I think he did really a fantastic job on it. And uh, the music is one of the best things about the game. Yeah. So I, I was very, very proud of it. This was also coming to Altar, this kind of standardization and, uh, and division of the labor to small subparts, which, you know, that you are expert on a tree, for instance, but you do it whole life. I didn't want that. Yes, so maybe you preferred um, the earlier stage of uh, the development of the W. Definitely. It was like much more like hodgepodge, everything. And it was even, you know, the the crucial change was also that 
after that, everything was turning to the 3D, you know, so it was really change of paradigm in many respects. Yes. You know, instead of like, uh, because before people who were able to draw and paint were quite on walk, which I was not actually, but I, was, I did some 3D modeling always, so I could do that and I did that in Altar. But after that, uh, it was much more about shaders, programming and, and all these really hardcore to work with polygons, you know, mm. like I think I, I, I was not very good at I mean, because I, I'm not that precise. Yeah. I do remember some of the missions still, like, I, if I would start to play it, I would get, like, because you can, uh, you can uh, set up a lot of steps ahead. And uh, in some missions, you could do that, that uh, you just, from the start, select so many steps that you will be nearly on the end of the mission. So I think some of them, especially the first uh, uh, mission from Americans and some of, I think it's a fifth mission with Stepan who was doing, which is a, a uh, there, there was a lot of work on the artificial intelligence inside. I think I would remember every step that will be done because every every player or uh, audience, I think they would like uh, to play games, develop the games, and they thinking, oh, you just playing the games. If you play one game and one mission, which is on the beginning really really crooked because it not worth even 15 percent, and when you play it for 1,000 times you're starting to hate that mission. Some of the content I do remember, some of the story, I was just thinking that I think the Russian part I'm not so much... I don't remember it so much. The American, yes, with the aliens which was coming inside, yes. I remember a little bit of Arabic campaign which wasn't de uh, developed after that, which was pretty. It was really nice, it was like an Arabian Nights, a little bit like a story, a fairy tale, but yeah, it happened. <laughs> oh, the, the initial plan, the initial plan was to have uh, three campaigns in the game, uh, Russian, American and Arabian, or mercenary. And uh, then we were not able to do it because we were running out of time. We mm, still took uh, almost one year longer to finish the game than we originally planned. And then, in, so then we decided, uh, let's uh, make this uh, third campaign optional as a DLC. And then we decided to drop it uh, altogether and just publish the game. But we never really got very far uh, with that uh, third campaign. Uh, we, we had like general idea what it's going to be about. It would follow the, the, the same uh, plan as the other two campaigns. That is, there will be branching towards the middle, and, and of course you would meet uh, the characters from uh, the other two campaigns. But we never got much further than this. I don't think we really had like uh, all the missions, for example, laid out. I think uh, we, we really. Didn't just had uh, this, this broad idea. And we, we never actually scripted the missions and recorded voiceovers for them and so on. So we actually decided quite early on that uh, we will focus on just two campaigns. There were still um, some designer notes for the Arabian campaign uh, that we, we found a uh, long time ago in, in the game's uh, folders. Um, yeah, that's <laughs> probably know more about it than I do. Ah, uh, yeah. Well, how do you feel actually on on that kind of thing? Uh, on how the community kept working on the game even this year to release new content, new modes. Uh, I, yeah, I think it's absolutely amazing. I think this is the most amazing thing about the game that uh, still 20 years on. Uh, people are maintaining it, people are playing it, it still appeals to people. Are, I think this is absolutely amazing and uh, it's a testament to the uh, vision of Vladia Hvatil, the, the main designer and the, like, the creative brain behind the game, that it was really a timeless vision that 
It's absolutely astounding. I'm really surprised that that it works. We tried to have it really nice, and uh, actually, uh, from the beginning, there was the thought that there will be a possibility to have the editor and everything available for community. So it will live after our focus change to different games. So this is really, really beautiful to see that it's it's working this way. If you ever mm -hmm. thought about a return to OW as a player sometime, like, did you sometimes turn on your game and, and dive into some nostalgia, you know, or...? <laughs> well, I'm, I'm not against it. Mm -hmm. Like, if you would really appreciate it and you would... If, if you would pursue it other guys, I'm not against that. Even so, I didn't really play it for years. Uh, and I, I don't really play much games now. Like, mm -hmm. you know, if I have some spare time, I go running to woods, like, honestly. Yeah. That's, the, that's the only thing I do in my free time. <laughs> because we have a small boy, like two years, and it's, uh, I don't have much stuff that's to, wonderful. to be on. <laughs> but anyway, uh, it's not something which I would play again, because there are a lot of new games which are really better. And to see that the original war is still alive, it's really, really interesting. <laughs> Unfortunately, I don't, I don't see this happening. Uh, I... Uh, might actually play it uh, once in a while, but I, I really very, very rarely play uh, online multiplayer games, uh, regardless of uh, the type. It's just uh, I am really bad at it, and uh, and I will so, so uh, it's not such an enjoyable uh, experience getting crushed by uh, other players. And, uh, and in developing or returning to development, that's really like uh, you, like they say, you will never enter the same river twice. That's, and now this river really is, uh, has been flowing for 20 years. We all are, uh, as developers or as a team, we are all uh, different people now and uh, it will be very difficult to somehow try to rekindle uh, this old flame and uh, surely I can see well, it might happen that a new team uh, will appear and will try to evolve it and uh, do something with it and if, if this happens and I, I have no information that this is like somebody even considers it. But if it happened, I would certainly wish uh, those people a lot of luck. But uh, for me personally, I don't see myself uh, going back to this uh, this universe. Yeah. Which is kind of sad, but yeah, I mean, I, part of me would like to wish to return. It was really enjoyable and uh, I was 20 years younger, so that certainly is uh, an appeal to but uh, I don't, like, rationally speaking, I don't think this is feasible. When I saw some footage which you shared, uh, it was like, oh, I don't even remember this and that. Uh, it's a long time, I'm, I'm already quite old, and I found out that uh, I'm not in that old age when you remember what you did uh, as a 20 years old. <laughs> but, but it's really nice nostalgia. It's uh, I, I just uh, figure out that okay, I have the still author's copy of the original war at home. Uh, when I will visit my parents, I will most likely take it back and I will try to play it again because really lot of things I don't remember. <laughs> and about 3D models, um, can you tell us? Huh? Um, what what kind of 3D modeling you did? Uh, you worked on buildings, uh, if I'm not wrong, right? Uh, you are right. Uh, so I I did quite a few different things. So so I, I did interface. If I'm not wrong, then all of them, I think. Oh, okay. All of them in, in the final game. I, I hope I'm not wrong. Then I did I did buildings. I guess I also did buildings for all all three parties. All three. Uh, okay. And then, uh, then I did some, I did some retouching on a, 
uh, I guess maybe you know that the backgrounds, I, I guess you know that so the backgrounds are one big huge bitmap. Yes. And uh, we did it with the Bryce that day. So the Bryce was quite cool software for the landscape modeling. And do you rem remember what kind of program did you use yourself to make uh, maybe the interfaces or the buildings? This kind of thing. So we, yeah, so we did 3D Studio Max, like mostly, but uh, so that was the, the buildings and everything. At that time, it was version 2 or 4, I don't know. Okay. Uh, and and uh, the landscape was from Bryce, but then what what I did on that was that you had to basically, so we, we rendered several layers of that, and then we manually kind of retouched it to, to one compounded piece, you know, like uh, we, had, we we used the grass for this part and, and whatever. Huh? So we yeah. combined it from several layers. Mm -hmm. So that's also what I did a bit. And at the later stage, I worked on a on something you would call now like uh, like advertisement, like posters and some kind of things like that. Oh yeah, like so there's there, there was around, maybe it is still somewhere there. Maybe I have somewhere on a hard drive, but I didn't search for that. So so we did model of the of the of the alien embryo, some kind of like small thing with a look like something between alien and worm. So that's what I was working on as well. If you, well, since you mentioned Nazgul, so he's one of those really that's quite amazing because many people in Altar were really like even from the nowadays perspective they're really gifted, you know, and hardworking. He was one of those, so he was coming. I don't know where, where he is now, I didn't see him for ages, but he was he was coming from the eastern Slovakia, from Preshov, and his mom was, was uh, teaching art on a kind of secondary school, and he, he was a real, real sculptor, you know, so he, before he came to Altar, he was he really did some, some kind of like uh, sculptor work, and he was really gifted even in a, in a drawing, and. So many people were like in different directions, but but quite special. Like uh, this is something. I mean, maybe in a in the games industry, this is still something which is very strong. But I don't. I'm not that much in touch with that, so I cannot say. But definitely in a in a kind of general creative fields, like what you can see, for instance, in a, like uh, website agencies and stuff like that. Yes. At least here in Central Europe. So those guys are like, uh, from the point of, of graphics, compositions and techniques, that, that are really, really poor in comparison with, with those people at the games industry. Mm. You know, because it was, it was somehow appreciated that, that, that someone really, that, that we, we can do something really quite well and we, that we pursue certain direction. And even at that time, it was appreciated that the different people have different point of view on a graphic. So that's also, that's for instance why we had to change many things many times because it didn't really hold together quite well because there were different approaches, different visuals yeah. together, you know. Uh, about, about that, um, we know that OW uh, went, in, went into a huge graphical uh, reshape. Um, mm -hmm. If I send you this screenshot here, yeah, please do. Uh, this one, it looks very different from the final release. Uh, do, you, mm. do you have any recall yeah. of that? You know, the, the old buildings? Uh, funny to see that. Show me. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I did that interface. It's quite cool, actually. The, there is this one, too, that I, I can send you right now. So it was a, mm -hmm. I, I suppose mm -hmm. these were um, alpha footage. Um, maybe you know of some buildings. Well, you, you remember the, the final uh, building's look uh, and, and appearance. Um, mm -hmm. I, I can, I can uh, send you a screenshot mm -hmm. if you want of how they look like. Yeah, so, so you, are, you are pointing on that blue, on that green building, right? Or, or what? Uh, on the first screenshot, uh, it will be the look of the vehicles are not really the same. The, the perspective is a bit different. Uh, the, the characters are a bit zoomed in and you know the the, the buildings, the, the green buildings, in, in, indeed, is a bit different. It's not the same. So I, I thought, since you're a 3D artist on OW, maybe you have some record on, on the old buildings. The and, yeah, I recognize all of them which you show me now. 
but it's difficult for me to really recover some kind of development in, a, in, a, in that. Do you know if it were how the reshape of the game was uh, discussed in during the development by, by the, the entire team, or do you have only by, maybe blurry memories and couldn't really recover? At, at, the, at the very beginning, it was really so. There were many versions of, of everything which later on were not used. I'm quite sure about it because it was, you know, the at those early periods, the, the development was, was going in certain kind of leaps, you know, it was some stages. So it was usually um, forced by, by the need to have some kind of presentation for some type of game, game conference, right? So to put something together, which we can show to someone. Yes. So then, then everything was done really hastily, very quickly. And later on, it was changed usually. So. But, but these buildings you show me now, I, I believe they're in the final game, aren't they? Like all of them, no? Um, no, not all of them are in the final game. Um, uh -huh. Maybe on the second screenshot, um, some of the buildings yeah. are actually in the final game, but on a different mm -hmm. perspective. Um, uh, true. Let, let me sh send you a screenshot of um, how it looks like now, maybe, so you can compare. Basically, the game doesn't work with perspective. This, that's kind of, I think you, you can see it. So the because the the landscape doesn't really work with perspective. That's, that's obvious, right? Yeah. Because it it because then you wouldn't you couldn't scroll over the image because the things at the back would be smaller and whatever, right? So, but I think and I think this was this was really really practice at, in, in those days. Like uh, if I would re recover names of those games. So there were really games which were strategies which used I think some kind of same type of strategy like uh, having non-perspectives basically orthographic background but then things on that were with the perspective and the reason for that is that the building without perspective were really sometimes very clumsy you know it, it appeared like Non-realistic, yeah, extremely. Definitely. So that's that's why that's why maybe you you could see the some kind of evolution of perspective because maybe we tried this and that would, would work. Yes. Like the and the at the at the American base, at the second image you showed me, it's it's quite obvious that the, those buildings have quite strong perspective actually, which which doesn't really fit together well with the landscape. But yeah, I, I think that was the type of style which was used at that time. You can see it's a bit different, and especially on the last picture, um, you can see a building on the center, which is a Russian depot, and if you compare it with mm -hmm. the first picture I sent you, yeah, it's but, very different. But, 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 yeah. So true, true, true. Th that's what uh, struck um, some of the community members. Like they were asking, uh, how did uh, the, the, the old buildings get re reworked and what, for what reason, etc. So, so yeah, that's. Uh, oh, I see, I see, I see. Mm -hmm. True. I think I did both of those versions actually. Even so, I'm not entirely sure, but I definitely did the last version. And there, yeah, there was some kind of change. Of design and stuff like that and for instance trees which are really amazing I think so the trees were all delivered by by external artists um, was it Hansa yeah, Stambera. yeah. Uh, and he was working at that time he was working at Czech television hmm. and this was his side job Wow <laughs> side job and, 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 he, worked on yeah. and he, he always came to the office with the I don't know with a with the hard drive or something, he connected that and showed us new trees, and they're all of them amazing. <laughs> I even remember how he did it. I think either he had some plugin to free your Studio Max, it, or it was also done in Bryce, maybe. I, I really don't know. Hmm. Okay. But that that really looked very realistic. Yeah, it did, and uh, there are so many. He made a few thousands of trees. Yeah, he made quite a few. <laughs> He's a madman. <laughs> <laughs> so, for instance, we have reshaped the in-game interface, so it looks a bit more modern and is on better uh -huh. resolutions. Yeah, it's quite nice. Yeah, I'm going... So, who did it? Um, Stuart Curry and uh, Sally 
Uh, they are both mm-hmm. um, working on, on, on what we call ski, which is a new technology for or- original war. And it brings a lot of new modding capacities and lot, lots of new modes. Yeah, I mean, th- this, is, this is amazing, guy. <laughs> I don't have much to say about it. I mean, I, I would like to ask you guys, like, why you really play it. I mean, <laughs> uh, but I think this kind of like this like, type of geeky passion which you have, I, yeah, I admire it. There was a thing, uh, questions regarding the, some uh, game rules that the artifacts will be some additional uh, bonuses, uh, which I think I saw in some additional games as well, later on or before, don't remember, it's too, too late. Okay. <laughs> but uh, the Alliance itself, there was a, some thoughts about in the database that we will add some additional race or we will add some things more, not only the Arabic uh, campaign, but details, wow. Because after then we had uh, the original uh, war crew and the other guys were uh, starting and even on the finishing of the original war we were discussing the UFO, it's come. Yeah, so uh, the aftermath and everything, it's just starting to blur. I don't know which one was the aliens there or that, but yes, uh, I, I, I do definitely do remember that we were thinking about some multiplayer uh, maps, which will be a more uh, like an alien rise, yeah, because with the multiplayer, you don't need to have it in the canon of the story. You can just have it like for fun, which yeah. the multiplayer is supposed to be. But uh, on the end, I think there was not so many resources left to, to, to finish some of the player maps. And actually, this one would uh, require to add new units. And with the, each unit, you have a weeks of development because even the stupid house, you need to have a, a destruction phases, you need to define it and everything. So it, from the graphical point of view, would take much longer to develop and create than to just say, okay, uh, this unit will have the same uh, same properties and everything like a Russian tank, but it will appear differently and will have one small different thing. And uh, you can make it in a code and in the uh, game itself, you can make it really fast, but by, from the graphical point of view, you need to uh, do a lot of animations, a lot of new things. So, I think Aliens and this part was one of the first things which we just said, okay, no, not to do, do that. Even we would, on the beginning, it was more uh, to, okay, we have a free campaigns, we would like to have Arabic, we would like to have Russians, and Americans and on the end we had to cut even uh, uh, one of the campaign because of the resources and yeah. it it was a really uh, nasty thing to do because Arabic was nearly everything units and everything you can see it it's already done uh, mm-hmm. the uh, the maps which some of them could be reused and uh, uh, the storyline, voiceover, and everything would need to be added. And but this small part would take a minimum half a year. At the time, I would say more than half a year to, to implement and to test and everything. So that was a unfortunate decision based on money and time. I I don't think that we had some large. Uh, idea about the aliens uh, the story was developed as i said the whole concept of the game was developed by vladia and uh, had some small influence on it but the idea basically was that he started with the game mechanics and then he worked backward towards the kind of story that would explain the mechanics so the, the core of the game is the limited pool of soldiers and the limited pool of supplies that appear uh, on the 
on the playing field more or less randomly. So there are no like minds that like in traditional RPG games. Also, uh, there are minds for the other resources, but this uh, one resource just is evenly spread uh, across. So more or less evenly it depends on the mission, but uh, it's spread uh, around the battlefield. So how, so that this was the, the design and we wanted, we knew from the beginning we wanted to have this game that sort of blend between RPG and RTS. So you have uh, soldiers that you take from mission to mission, they have some stats, they get better, they gain experience and you have this kind of attachment to it. We played uh, Jacket Alliance a lot uh, where you have this kind of uh, similar idea that uh, you have uh, this pool of soldiers and of course uh, in uh, XCOM games you have the same uh, idea and of course these are turn-based strategies we were a real-time strategy and I, I think for real-time strategy it was a quite a, a novel idea and then uh, we needed a mechanic so somehow so some kind of uh, um, device that would explain why it is so, so you must be at some place where you are limited and at yet you still get uh, some resources and of course uh, we could go to some uh, like um, sci-fi setting where you have some settlers you brought uh, with you in a spaceship and from time to time you get reinforcements uh, and so on but uh, we decided to go with this uh, time travel uh, setting because it felt because it was much more fun and it also allowed us to create uh, other what I think are fun elements in the game like you can tame uh, the ape man and then they can work for you and uh, you have um, this uh, and, and and you have this like uh, time loop story that uh, in in the Russian campaign and the American campaign are mirror images of each other. Mm -hmm. So uh, this all is allowed by using time travel. So we just needed this time travel device, and we knew pretty much uh, what we uh, what we need that we need a, a device that can only take one soldier or some limited amount of supplies and and will transport them uh, into the past so that's how we how we started and we never really developed this idea that much uh, further uh, we, the idea that uh, Siberium or Alaska is actually called fusion uh, catalyst was was actually an idea of Philip Wipper who was working for Virgin Interactive and he, he suggested it and we were discussing what it is this this uh, uh, miraculous mineral that you are mining uh, in Siberia so uh, so this is uh, a an example of influence or how we were working with, uh, with the publisher. And we, we liked the idea and it made it uh, into the game. It's, it's not really that important in the game, it's just mentioned in one uh, of the intros, but uh, it's a it's piece of this uh, lore uh, for the game. And, uh, and so we decided we will just go with it and, uh, and, and steal uh, the idea and have put our own explanation. Like hundreds of people put uh, uh, their own explanation on it, so we are not that exceptional in this respect. But, uh, and we never really had, uh, never developed the idea of what's behind it. Like, who actually built Eon and uh, why it travels to Earth, and if there is some like, different civilization that will one day come and come and reclaim it. And, uh, we, we really were interested in Eon as uh, just a plot device or something that will explain the game mechanics we wanted to have in the game. Yeah. 
there were not many games like OW that that was a RTS and a mix of a GRPG. Um, maybe I, I can think of Commander, maybe, but any other game, I, I don't know. Aliens, a little bit. I think that's from the time. And yeah, not many. Mm -hmm. the, the thing is that most of the games were just like, okay, produce as many units as you can and just kill them in the same uh, same campaign. Uh, yeah. When you uh, when you take the command and conquer, uh, that you had the one commander which was going from one to the second mission or third mission, it was like, oh, I can keep this unit mm -hmm. here. But okay, there was no uh, additional experience points or whatever. But the thing is that yeah, uh, even that was a, like an innovation that yeah you have the same uh, commander in each of the uh, mission. Yeah, in ours was just okay. You have five people, and you you five people pass to the next mission. If there was three people killed, you had a really hard start to the next mission. And mm -hmm. I do remember on the beginning it was done the way it was really old school that you could finish the mission with one person. You get to the next uh, uh, map, and you didn't get the replacement. So it mm -hmm. was harder and harder and harder, and we had to change that. That you have uh, just some generic people to appear or uh, replace them, because otherwise uh, not many people will be <laughs> able to get to the end. Uh, especially when the experience uh, could make a lot of difference in how the unit is trained and what what kind of things. Uh, if you had a really well trained uh, engineer or mechanic. It would be really good in the um, as a strategical advantage against uh, your competitors. So losing one would mean a lot, and a lot of people were doing it the way that okay, we I will restart the game just to save one 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 person. <laughs> the thing is that. Uh, during the development of the game, there are a lot of things which you are thinking about. I do remember uh, not only about the original war, but we were thinking what to be after the original war, what we will develop. And there, there is, a, we were having a session where in one room, everyone was sitting on the floor because there was not enough chairs, if I do remember. And we were just going and bouncing with the ideas, what what to do, how how to alter uh, things, what would be making it. Uh, sometimes uh, some things would make the game easier and with more of the story. But uh, the problem was that with the story you have a narration. With the narration you have a lot of cuts in the budget which you need to make on the other side. That's why actually Arabian. Uh, campaign was cut because not enough resources to to make it, and uh, so a lot of those I I don't remember exactly. I do remember the dinosaurs because that was really funny. And one time they just say yeah 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 let's do that, and the second day they just say oh no 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 don't do that because there are so many games with the dinosaurs it would be really really strange and problematic to, for marketing to to sell it. But uh, some particulars, I know th uh, with the uh, destructions and the graphical parts, there are a lot of alterations because uh, when you have, for example, destruction of buildings or, uh, or the units in general, uh, you have a lot of flames, a lot of smokes. And we, uh, we, were, uh, we were helping uh, with the graphicals. Uh, I think Oscar was doing the, all the smokes and yeah, uh, who I don't remember the name now. But uh, uh, he was just creating a really nice smokes and effects, and we were putting them on the on the each destruction of the building, and we were a little bit overboard. And our PCs were just like, okay, no, out of memory, and everything slowed down so much. Then uh, we were just like, okay, we can't do that. So uh, I think like 80% of the destruction, which was like, oh, we need to have it, everything to see that every time it will be a little bit different. 
and uh, we were just like, no, 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 we can, we need to cut it down because it cannot be uh, moved on normal computers. And uh, I do remember that Virgin Interactive, in some time, they they just uh, trying to push us that even on much older computers, you will be able to run the game. And uh, we were having a really hard time to, to do that. Even when we launched the uh, original war, the first uh, maps and everything was for the uh, normal PCs at the time. But for example, the last, uh, last uh, mission, which is a really huge map against Russians, and there is a huge base, uh, time to time we had to change it because uh, units were get stuck and it was just the base was just going overfilled with the units cannot find the way out and in uh, our computers that time which were not so uh, uh, I would say not so old it was quite, quite new computers which most of the gamers didn't have at home and it got stuck and you were having like I would say 15 frames and you were just uh, like, oh, I would like to really finish it. So we had to do a lot of alteration, not only for the game mechanics, some missions had to be changed. So a lot of last things which we were doing was actually optimization because that was not, uh, uh, there was a time like first one and a half year where we were sitting and thinking, okay, what to add, what to do differently, what to... And I think the last year at minimum was just, okay, we need to uh, you, we need to have it for a slower CPUs, less memory. And so it was more like where to cut something which will not have a significant impact on storyline or how we would like to have the game visible. Yeah, so uh, I, I do remember that because at the time was really famous, uh, real time strategies was really a lot, and there was uh, ideas regarding uh, having a possibility to make it more like a command and conquer. Yeah, that uh, you will be just uh, a lot of units. You will just place a lot of units, and you uh, you will be having a huge skirmishes. But then it was going against the core of the game that you have such a limited amount of people. There, a little bit of that. It's a remote, uh, the uh, computer remote uh, uh, vehicles and units. Yeah, that was the possibility to produce as many units as you want, and you don't have that loss when you're going to lose Macmillan or someone because oh, you cannot replace it. And that was the goal that, okay, you have a few people which you will nourish and you will try to uh, get them survive through the whole mission. I do remember some uh, some testers were just like, oh, I replayed this mission five times because one of my people just uh, died. And one, one request was that for the apes, to, to have been able to move it from one mission to another. And uh, I think it was completely scrapped because it would mean that on the beginning you would have a lot of uh, apes helpers and on the end you had again a lot of units which you would not care which one is happening or not. So it will be disposable. And yeah, a lot of those thoughts were around. Yeah. Even there was some thought how to use in the same universe to make a... You, you were creating a card game. Uh, we were thinking about uh, what to do uh, to have a little bit like a different genres. How to how to do it like an RPG or something like that. Because some RPG uh, parts were already in the original war. But uh, that was just the ideas. There, there was over the year we had uh, so many ideas, some were really crazy, which are not publishable any <laughs> anymore. But yeah, uh, it's like uh, just brainstorming. Okay, what we can do, what we can't. Yeah. On the end, it was uh, mainly what we can cut the way that we will be on budget and the CPUs and the RAMs were enough to. to, uh, to actually game that the game will be a little bit faster. 
we were quite peaceful. Or we really did all, all these crazy things, like we, like we just decided in the middle of night, like 1 a.m., and we, we took like we took like a big piece of, of like plastic, like I don't know, like plastic bag, but huge one. Maybe it was maybe for for the liter or something. And we went to the to the hill, and we were like using it as a, as a slides. Like three guys on that of four down the hill, and we did it for two hours, and then we went to pub. And we came back at 5 a.m. and stuff like that. So we had fun. Well, I, I, I'm really grateful uh, to the community. Uh, I said that, I want to stress it. I, I'm really amazed and I, I'm very, very grateful that uh, people still find our game worth playing. And that, that's amazing. So thank you guys. Well, thank you very much for taking the time to actually join me on this interview and for having worked on the game uh, before. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Have <laughs> a great time. Yourself. Yeah, have a good, great day. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. Okay, so thank you and keep in touch. Take care. Bye. Okay, if you need anything else, just let me know. I'm, I'm trying to reply as fast as I can. Sometimes it's possible, sometimes it's not. But and, and now you have my Skype as well, so not a problem to, to write me. It was nice to meet you and give my best to all the community. That's very nice of you. Okay. <laughs> all right, then. See you. Yeah, bye-bye. <laughs> Thank you. Bye-bye. Precisely. What kind of scam is this? Well, maybe I'll just sit this one out. Comrade, I have an information for you. A new video is underway in 2021. Tell the community. Over.